Good morning. I'm Anna Karugati, the Group Editorial Director of World Screen. I'm delighted to be here today um, to speak with Anne Sweeney, someone who I've had the honor and the pleasure of speaking to numerous times in the past. Anne is no stranger to MIPCOM or to Cannes. Early in her career, when she was a programming executive at Nickelodeon, she frequented the halls of the Palais often. Um, after Nickelodeon, she joined FX Net Networks as chairman and CEO. She then joined the Walt Disney Company in February of 1996. And since then, her career has been illustrious indeed. Uh, today she is, as you can see, she's the co-chair of Disney Media Networks and president of Disney ABC Television Group. That encompasses a large group of assets. I will mention a few. ABC Studios, the ABC ABC Television Network, the ABC owned stations. Um, she handles news, she handles the Disney Channel portfolio of, a, she will tell you how many, there are more than 100 channels around the world targeting all age groups of children. She also has oversight of ABC Family in the United States and the equity interests in a &E Networks and Hulu. Um, I can almost consider Anne a friend. I'm going to have her come out now. She's had a great career. We're going to talk about all the wonderful things that she's done, including her eye for spotting um, opportunities in technology far ahead of everyone else. Please join me in welcoming Anne. And I should have mentioned also that you graced these stages just three years ago when you were personality of the year at MIPCOM. So we haven't spoken in a while, but it's great to see you again. And I'm sure MIPCOM is great. I'm so happy to have you back. I mentioned you started your career in, these, in the halls of the bunker, so to speak. Um, having attended MIPTV and MIPCOM frequently, what knowledge did you gain back then that then helped you shape your global vision and the expansion of the Disney portfolio of channels? Well, I, I think that's exactly it. I think MIP and MIPCOM gave me a worldview. Without MIP and MIPCOM, I would have been a very dedicated US-centric programmer. And in the early days of cable, particularly in, in kids' television, we didn't have the opportunity to buy product in the U.S. Much of that went into the U.S. syndication market right. and was aired uh, weekday afternoons and Saturday mornings. So we had to go outside of our country, outside of our comfort zone, and be introduced to new and different animation, new and different formats, different kinds of programming to program the early days of Nickelodeon. Right, which was one of the first that brought in different points of view and different voices, but that the Disney Channel then picked up on that, right? It's always uh, been open to new ideas. You've, you've taken programming from around the world for Disney as well, haven't we you? We have, and, and I think the, the beauty of Disney is that it speaks a universal language to kids and to families. Uh, Disney, as a brand, touches on issues and emotions and feelings that people have all over the world. You look at the success of Frozen, and yes. I'm not singing Let It Go today, I promise, but <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is playing at our booth on Riviera, Riviera Beach, just nonstop. And I do love the song, but I think what we have seen globally is an incredible response, an emotional response to the story of these two sisters. Yeah. And the song Let It Go, I think, has been very important, not just to kids, but to parents and adults as well. And it shows us in this world with so many divisions that there are things that we are similar, right? Children do have universal. More, that more unites us than divides us. Absolutely. Um, for a company like Disney ABC, what potential for growth do you see in the US, which is a very mature market? And then are there more opportunities internationally that you are seeing? There are really two paths to growth for us. One is the creative path which I think Gary Marsh and the team at Disney Channels Worldwide do so brilliantly. Certainly on the ABC side, Paul Lee, Patrick Moran, Kelly Lee, all of these great talents, these great programmers are constantly searching for the next great idea. And the same at ABC Family. Megan is here, Tom Ashheim is, is now our new president. So we have this great collection of people who are searching out 
new ideas and new formats. So that is a growth engine, and we think of ourselves as a content engine. The other path is technology, both technology that we create and technology that we utilize. And in fact, our boss, Bob Iger, has three big goals for the company. The first is creative excellence, the second is international growth, and the third is using technology to make everything that we do better. And a good example of the cre creation of technology, which is not something you would think of in the television division of the Walt Disney mm -hmm. Company, but was the creation of our ABC.com player back in 2005, 2006. We did a beta, and then we were the first to stream episodes right. of our television shows. We were the first broadcast network to put our shows on Netflix. We were the first to create a watch app that allowed you to stream programming while it was being broadcast. So this is something that we've done not just because we could, but because it gave us a way to be closer to our consumers. We knew people were walking around holding their phones or carrying their phones with them every single day. We wanted to be in their hands. We wanted to be with them every step, to be available not just with entertainment, but news and information that was important to them. That's right. You left out the iTunes deal. Oh, the iTunes deal, yes. That was in 2005. That was actually, that, and I'm glad you brought it up, that first moment when we realized we could be somewhere other than television. Right. DVDs, yes, and, and videotapes before. But it was still the TV screen. It, yes, it was still the screen. But I, I do remember Steve Jobs walking in with the video iPod. I still have mine. Wow. I still have mine. <laughs> I kept it in a drawer. But thinking, I was enjoying watching Lost, which was such a big show, yeah. on this tiny screen. And I thought, I'm so critical of everything we do and making sure everything is perfect. And if I'm enjoying this experience, it's quite possible that, that many people will enjoy it well, too. And you had a focus group of young kids at home too, right? You had, they're early adopters. How did they latch on to all this new technology? It's it amazing, was, isn't it? It's amazing. It's absolutely seamless. It's as if they were born holding their phones at this point. <laughs> yeah, and I think kids just you know, naturally gravitate toward technology. I, mean, I remember my son, in the, who's now 29, very early on, we had um, you know, a half-inch tape player. Right. And he would watch and watch and watch, and one day it wouldn't work. And I had to fish a piece of candy out of it. And I said, why did you put the candy in the machine? I'm sure a lot of parents have had this experience. And he said, because I wanted to see it on the television set. Oh, wow. So he was making that association very early. My, my boy is two years younger than, before he could walk or talk, he knew, knew how to work the, D well, it was a video tape machine yeah. back then. So he could fast forward, stop, even if I wasn't in the room. And yeah. we thought they were so brilliant. Oh, didn't we? They, they were yes. geniuses. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because, let, let, let me pick up from there, not only young kids, but all of us now are watching content on whatever screen is most con con mm -hmm. um, convenient for us. Where do you see linear channels? Are they still a, a viable business? Do you see them remaining a viable business? And what do they have to do to remain relevant? You know, I, I think the key is remaining relevant. I think the linear, the linear channels are still wonderful. They're still a great business for our company and many entertainment companies. But what we realized early on is that they're not the only business that we should be in with our content. And to your point about being everywhere on whatever device, whenever you want us, has really become more the norm for us. But we do notice there are still certain types of viewing that people do on their television sets. You know, certainly big live events. The Oscars had record numbers this past year and really remain what we call the Super Bowl of ABC. Right. Certainly the Super Bowl is something right. that you would also be watching in the moment on a big screen. And I think for many people, there are many television shows they want to see that way. But the change that we've seen, and Gary Marsh and I were talking about this last night, is the uptick in DVR yeah. usage. Yeah. We have seen people start to, oddly, put their lives first, and television second. It used to be you, you didn't have a means to catch up on episodes. Now you have many ways. You have your DVR. 
uh, which fortunately is measured now. We know how many people are watching and watching the commercials. But we also have you know, a way to catch up on your phone or other devices. OK, I'm not supposed to be um, objective because I'm a reporter, but two shows that are must watch when they're live, I'm sorry, are Scandal and now how to commit, uh, how to get away with murder. Yeah. You've got to watch them, and there's a whole tweeting that the, the connection between Twitter has been amazing, right? Bringing people back to the live broadcast. Exactly, and it's so interesting. It's, you know, many people I think in the early days of Twitter understood it as a marketing tool. It isn't. It is a community tool, and you have to make sure you understand your community of viewers. And I think that's what. Shonda and Kerry Washington and all of the actors on Scandal understood so well. They understood that people wanted to be there in the moment with them. And it becomes an even more interesting experience when you are having that experience with the people you're watching on the screen, with the right. people that you, you do race home to see them on Thursday night. And you don't want to get a phone call or go online right. unless you have seen the episode. And thankfully, Shonda Land and Pete Nowak have given us how to get away with murder. And I can still hear Viola Davis's voice in my head, yeah, how to, to get, get away, away with murder. <laughs> but she has made that, they have made that an absolutely must-see moment. Absolutely. Um, in fairness, for um, there's also wasn't uh, Pretty Little Liars also a, one of the shows that had most Twitter traffic during. Well, Pretty Little Liars predated Scandal, right? And their Twitter traffic is even higher than Scandal's. And this is the the genius of Marlene King and ABC Family. They really did click into again the community aspect right. of Pretty Little Liars and the mystery. And I think what Marlene did so well was to just give the audience, her Twitter audience, enough to go on. And I was on stage with her at, uh, we were speaking at an event, and she actually tweeted something out before we went on stage, two minutes before we went on stage. And five minutes into the conversation, she said, let me check, and she was trending on Twitter. So she herself has become wow. yeah. a household name in addition to Pretty Little Liars. I was liars. having a conversation with another mother that I catch up with here at the market, and we're wondering, what will our children's thumbs, how well developed are they going to be in the next generation? This is all they do. It do you is. realize it, at the table, getting my daughter not to use her phone at the table is a whole other thing, but you, you find opportunities in that, don't you? There's a way of connecting to people who love their devices so much. Right, I'd like to think that it's improving their eye-hand coordination. I mean, we could go there easily. <laughs> but you know, we also have to be ready for what's next. It right. could be that voice activation is where we go next. So we will miss the days when they were using their fingers this way. Yeah. But you know, I, I think that every new technology taps into a different piece, you know, certainly of our brains and certainly in the way we use it. You know, I remember growing up with a regular television set before remote control. I was the human remote control. Oh, you'd have to I get had to up run and, across absolutely. the room. Absolutely. But you know, the thumbs now, and and who knows what's going to follow? Eye recognition. Who knows? Yeah, it's it's a little scary, but it also, like I said, there are tremendous opportunities. Mm -hmm. As you look back over the the last years you've had at Disney, were there any aha moments that you would like to, aside from iTunes, anything else? It, that either was a surprise or was really planned that, that you are particularly proud of? You know, there were there are two moments, and, and they're related, and they were ahas of different kinds. One was the creation of the Watch app, because it's not just Watch ABC, it's Watch the Disney suite of channels, it's Watch ABC Family. The Watch apps were just you know, this is a little bit inside baseball, but this required every single member of our team coming together at the very best and very highest levels that they could achieve. This was something that we had actually planned to release in May of this year. And in January of 2013, I had been very, I'd been watching a lot of people on their phones, and I, I think I was actually in the grocery store one day, and I, I was watching 
just this use of technology. And I started to feel very anxious that we were going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. That, not that someone was going to beat us, but just that we weren't answering the call from consumers. We weren't available. We weren't on their phones. We, we just had to be there. So I went into our team and said, could we move our date up, our release of the watch apps up by a year? Oh. And they looked at me and said, give us two weeks and we'll come back and tell you what that means. Okay. And it meant other projects would be pushed to the back burner. It, it meant a lot of things. It meant that we had to learn even faster what it meant to clear the rights, the conversations yeah. that needed to happen with advertisers, clearing commercials, a raft of issues. But the team committed and we finished 20 minutes before our deadline oh. in May. 20 minutes before. And not only did we finish, but it worked. And I know it worked because Bob Iger was in a cab riding around Manhattan and he would call and say, it's working from the west side, it's working from the east side, it's working, and we had other people in cabs who were out there. But we wanted this to be a part of our upfront presentation, really to, not to just be the first, but to really inspire this moment of change in the industry. So that was a, wow. that was a huge aha moment. But when we were in the testing phase and we were testing this with kids, we actually did focus groups with very young children, you know, our Disney Junior audience. And we had them on tape, and I sat there watching hours of tape, and I saw a brother and a sister just snuggled together in the corner of a couch watching a Disney Junior show on an iPad. And right across from them was a big screen TV. We had done the focus groups at home. And, I, and I, the little girl had a conversation with us afterward, and she said, well, I like to cuddle up with my brother and my Aww. iPad. And I thought, sometimes it isn't about the size of the screen, sometimes it's about the experience. Absolutely. And the, the experience can be inspired by a relationship or by your relationship with the content that we're giving you. And, and since the Walt Disney Company is a content engine at mm -hmm. its core, at some point, as long as you're creating content that people want to watch, where it winds up, how we watch it on what screen is somewhat secondary, right? The fact is that you want to get quality content out there for people to access in whatever way they want. Exactly. You know, Ben Pine was talking earlier this morning about Sheriff Cali. Sheriff Cali is a Disney Junior show that we actually put on the Watch app but we put it what we call behind the wall, meaning that you had to authenticate, authenticate. Yeah. As, right. a, as, a, as a cable subscriber. And it drove enormous traffic. And while it drove enormous traffic on the iPad and on the devices, it didn't spoil the experience for kids who then went on to watch right. it on television. Right. So, the management of these windows and of these devices is something that we now take into consideration with our content. Of course. We just have a little bit left. You've told me in the past that throughout your career, you've been guided, I imagine, by many principles, but one of them was do the thing that scares you the most. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little about that and what your next step is. Well, I do believe in doing what scares you, and I, I believe that the greatest gift you're given is curiosity. And I started my career before the professional part of my career uh, on the creative side. And that's been something that, that drove me into television. It was really my love of theater that drove me into television. And then I started in the cable industry at a very early stage when, you know, there still was a lot of hands-on for executives. And over the years, I've continued to love but become more distant from the creative process. So I've had this wonderful run at Disney. Our television group is in spectacular shape with great leadership. And Bob and I sat down, well, over a year ago, much, almost two years ago, and he said, so your deal is coming up, what do you want to do, three years, four years? And I said, well, let me think about it. And I started to think about what I wanted to do next. And of course, you always have a massive list of things you'd like to do in this great company. 
But then I started to think about the creative side. And I started to think about the thing that I really didn't get to do on a full-time basis. And I had actually had a few conversations over the years with people about directing. And it, it's something that I've always felt very drawn to. But what I'm going to do uh, as of January 31st next year is take the plunge, uh, apply to some directing workshops, and pursue the creative side. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, if not now, when? Exactly, exactly. Well, I wish we could go on, but I'm afraid they need the room for another session. Please join me in thanking Anne and wishing you all the best luck. Thank you. Thank you.